Well, howdy. howdy. It's great to be back with you for a second week in a row again. My name is Timothy Atik, and I'm the director of Breakaway Ministries here in town. Uh, I did go to Texas A&M University. I graduated in 2003. Okay, thanks. Great, cool. We'll just keep moving. Um, <laughs> And I just think about the fact that when I was in college here at A&M, God blessed me with some incredibly great friendships. And as I think back upon those friendships, I can't help but think about the prank wars that we had with each other. And just know that what I'm about to tell you, I'm in no way encouraging it, all right? Like, don't leave here and be like, you know what I learned at Grace Bible today? I learned that I should crush up fiber pills and put them in my friend's workout supplement to kind of help them with their plumbing. That's not what... I'm encouraging this morning, but I think about the prank wars that uh, my friends and I had with each other. I think specifically about this one time. It happened actually just down the street when I was living with four other guys in Midtown Apartments right there on Holloman. And uh, there was five of us in the apartment, and uh, one of the guys was downstairs in the living room studying with this girl, and he had this connection with this girl where there was just this romantic tension that was building in, in their friendship, and it reached this point where they just had to talk about things. And so they ended up going out into the parking lot of Midtown Apartments, and they just started taking laps around the parking lot to kind of hash this thing out. And so the other four guys in the apartment, we went up on the second story to just watch the whole thing unfold. And we figured that we would kind of set the mood for him to kind of help the conversation along. And so we lifted up the windows and we put speakers into the window and we started blasting the wedding march just because we figured <laughs> like that's where things were headed for these people. It turns out my friend was getting the friend talk from this girl, and so we totally misread the conversation. We were great friends to him that night. He was blessed to have us in his life. <laughs> but I think about that, and I just think, you know what? God gave me some great friendships while I was here at a and and as I graduated A&M and have even arrived to where I am now, God has used these people in the most significant times in my life. Like these were the guys that God used to help me piece my life back together when it crumbled because of sin. These were the guys who stood next to me on the altar when I married my wife, Catherine. These were the guys that I gathered in an apartment with when one of our closest friends passed away serving our country in Iraq. These were the guys that I contacted when I was trying to discern whether we were going to move from Waco to College Station. It honestly wasn't a difficult decision, but I figured I should contact them anyway. God has given me some great, deep, meaningful relationships in my life. And it just makes me think about what God said all the way back in Genesis chapter 2. We've barely gotten past the creation of day and night, sky and sea, and that what we find is Adam alone in the garden. And God looks upon Adam, and what does he say? He says, it is not good for man to be alone. And when we read that verse, we most naturally apply it to marriage. And that is a very fitting application, because God created marriage right after making that statement. But that statement doesn't only apply to marriage. That is... That is truth for life. Do you believe God, not me, but do you believe God when he says it is not good for you to be alone? That God has actually created you not just to thrive in, but to need deep, meaningful relationships in your life. God has wired you to, in a lot of ways, model the intimacy that God has among the members of the Trinity, you have Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three separate, co-equal, co-eternal persons that exist in one essence, perfect in intimacy, and God in some ways invites us into experiencing that type of intimacy with one another. Do you believe that God has wired you to need others? God has made you to live in relationships in which you are fully known and fully loved. So here's what I want to ask you to do. Just wherever you're sitting right now, I want to ask you to close your eyes real quick. And if you don't close your eyes, 
it's just going to be an awkward staring contest between us. So please, if you will, just close your eyes real quick. And here's what I want you to think about just in the quietness of your own heart. Who in this world truly knows you? Who in this world truly knows you? I'm not asking you if you have friendships or a bunch of acquaintances. I'm asking who in this world truly knows you. And what I mean by that is who in this world is very well acquainted with your strengths to the point that they can celebrate the good going on in your life. But not just that, they're also well acquainted with your weaknesses, like they've seen behind the curtain of your life. And so they're acquainted with your, your weaknesses and your sin, sinful tendencies and your insecurities. And they don't run from you, but they love you. With whom in this world are you fully known and fully loved? You can look back up at me. I want you to know that it is so much better to go through life experiencing intimacy than isolation. It is so much better being loved than being lonely. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look into the book of Ecclesiastes, and we're going to learn from the wisest person to ever walk on the face of the earth besides Jesus Christ. And here's what King Solomon is going to show us. And please don't miss what I'm about to say. This is why you should listen this morning, because what King Solomon is going to show us is he's going to show us the why. He's going to show us why we need deep, meaningful, authentic relationships in our lives. But then he's going to show us why many of us will hear this message and still go through life being around people without being known by people. I'll put it a different way. He's going to show us why many of us will hear this message and still settle living life in isolation. So if you have a Bible, turn with me this morning to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 is where we're going to be. Let me just remind you, if you weren't here last week, we are in a three-week series that we are calling We Are. And we're just having an honest conversation about who we are as people. Last week, we talked about the fact that we are difficult people. This week, we're talking about the fact that we are isolated people. Next week, We're going to talk about the fact that we are anxious people. And here's my goal. My goal is for us to realize that we can't change who we've been, and that's okay. But Jesus Christ can absolutely change who we will be from this day forward. So the hope is that we would be people who have defining moments with Jesus that we would each take a next step with him. And so my hope this morning is that many of us today would take a step out of isolation and into intimacy with one another. All right? Ecclesiastes chapter 4. I'm going to do something a little crazy this morning. I'm not going to teach the text in order. What I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to jump straight to the climax of the passage. And the climax of the passage is going to show us the why. It's going to show us why We need deep, meaningful relationships in our lives. And then we're going to zoom out, look at the surrounding verses, and they are going to show us why many of us will still settle for isolation. So look at what King Solomon says, starting in verse 9. He says this, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, If two lie together, they keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. And so Solomon kind of gives us his thesis, and it's this, two are better than one. And that, that hopefully doesn't take a lot of explanation. He's just saying two can accomplish more together than one person can do all by himself. And so what Solomon does is he kind of paints a picture of someone on a journey through life. And what he says is, man, if you're on a journey and you fall into a pit, I don't know when that would happen to you. But if it does, it sure is nice if you have someone else there who can help you out of the pit. 
He says, man, if you're on a journey and it's freezing cold at night, man, it sure is nice to have someone to cuddle up with and so that you're not shivering alone. You know what this means? It means that cuddling is biblical. <laughs> just kidding, all right? Let me just have a conversation with the single men in here. Do not let, I know it's going to get cold this week. Don't let me find you walking around campus saying, man, I'm just looking for a woman to apply the Word of God with, all right? <laughs> not going to work. He's just saying, man, if, if life gets cold, it's great to have someone there who can help keep you warm. He says, if you're on a journey and you get jumped, it's really nice if someone is there who has your back. And then he finishes this one little portion by saying, a cord, a, three, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. That is him kind of putting an exclamation on his point. He's saying, Two are better than one. Two are better than one. Two are better than one. You know what's better than two? Three. He's trying to make this point that living life in deep, meaningful relationships is far better than living life alone. And so let me just walk you back through these verses and kind of paint a picture of the life that God has created us for. Again, Solomon starts by saying two are better than one. Two are better than one. Why? Because they have a good reward for their toil. They can accomplish more. They can get more done. Let's apply this to our spiritual lives. If Solomon is right, if Solomon is right, if you truly want to get somewhere with God, if you want to experience great amounts of traction in your pursuit of Jesus Christ, then it is essential that you do not try and go about the Christian life on your own. You are going to need people running alongside you, encouraging you along the way. It helps me. I, I can't help but think about uh, when I was in high school. I ran cross country and track. And uh, the cross country race was a, it was a 5K. It was 3.1 miles. By far, hands down, without a doubt, the worst place you could find yourself in in a cross-country race would be about a mile and a half into the race, running completely by yourself. The way that a race would go is the first mile was all about adrenaline, so the gun would go off, and about 300 high school guys would take off from the starting line, and you'd be surrounded by people, and you'd just kind of get caught up in the flow of the race. But by mile two, the race would begin to spread out in these huge fields. And so if you're not careful, you might find yourself all alone, and I would call it running in no man's land, because the person in front of you would be too far in front of you to catch them, and the person behind you would be too far behind you to slow down and wait for them. And so what ends up happening is you stop looking ahead and you start looking at the ground. You don't stop running, but you definitely stop racing, and your pace slows down significantly. And all you can do is think. And so you start having thoughts like, why did I choose cross country in the first place? <laughs> like I did this by choice. And you have a side cramp, and all you can feel is the pain and the struggle. You know what the best thing is that could happen to you in that moment? The best thing that could happen to you is that without realizing it, you've slowed down so much that one of your teammates catches up to you, practically blows past you and says, let's go. And when that happens, you know what, you know what goes on? You start to look up again. You begin to race again. You begin to get traction. See, if you want to go somewhere spiritually, let me just ask you this. If you were just honest with yourself, are you where you want to be spiritually right now? Are you where you want to be? I would imagine that a good majority of people in here would probably say no. I would love to experience more growth. I'd rather be filled with more passion than I have right now. I would love to have more heartfelt knowledge about the Word of God. If that's you, let me just tell you, you're going to need a couple guys or a couple women in your life to run this race with. And man, we live in a time where it is easier than ever to encourage one another to pursue the Lord. There are, there are apps now 
where you and a couple of friends can all log in together and you can see what each other is reading. Y'all can read the same things, leave notes for each other, leave notes of what you've read, and you guys can journey through the scriptures together while you're not even in the same place physically. How great would it be if you and a couple of guys or girls just committed to memorizing the same verse each week, memorize one verse a week, and quiz each other on it during the week. Challenge each other to share your faith once this week, and then share stories about it together. If you want to go somewhere spiritually, I promise you, you're going to need some people who are committed to racing with you because God uses his people to challenge and encourage his people. Solomon goes on, and he says, For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. A good question for us to ask is, how do you bounce back from the times in life where you fall? It's not a matter of if you will fall into sin. It's a matter of when you do. Do you have the right people in your life to lift you up? How do you bounce back from from being overly harsh with your children? How do you bounce back from a few days or or a week or a month of just not being that great of a spouse? How do you bounce back from poor decisions over the weekend? How do you bounce back from compromising decisions at work or in school? How do you bounce back from these moments in which you fall? See, the reality is this. When Jesus Christ went to the cross, he went to the cross for all of our sins. And when Jesus Christ rose from the dead... His resurrection was a demonstration that God the Father accepted his payment for all of your sins. So what that means is that God's grace is sufficient today to cover over any failure in your life. God's love, his mercy, is capable of lifting you up today and allowing you to echo the words of Paul where you say, forgetting what is behind, but straining towards what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize. That is available today. Paul's words in Romans 8, chapter 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Those words can be your words today. But often when we fall, we feel unworthy to get back up. And so we, we end up drowning in guilt, shame, and regret. What you have to realize is God uses his people to lift up his people. Do you have a few men or a few women in your life who, when you fall, they are committed to stepping in and they refuse to let you go one more day without experiencing the the grace of God in your life? Do you have a few men or a few women who can help pick you back up, reaffirm God's love and commitment and delight in you and spur you on towards a life Where you leave that sin behind and pursue holiness in the Lord. Do you have those people in your life? Because God uses his people to lift up his people. Solomon says again, if two lie together, they keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? This is the reality of life. The reality of life is that that times can be bitter cold. Your reality right now might be extremely frigid. Why? Because cancer happens, divorce happens, breakups happen, unemployment happens, rejection from a student organization happens. Life can be extremely cold, and here's our tendency. If we are honest with ourselves, our tendency is when life is cold, we tend to retreat and go somewhere and shiver alone. But God uses his people to warm up his people. Do you have a few men or a few women in your your life who are committed to keeping you warm during the cold seasons of life? Like they love you enough to make sure that you get out of bed in the morning. They love you enough to make sure that you get to work. They're there at the funeral, sitting next to you. 
They're there ready to talk on the phone, to help you process. They're there to help combat the lies from the evil one. They're there to help you deal with your doubts. They're there to make sure that you eat. Do you have these people in your life who love you enough to not let you shiver alone because God uses his people to warm up his people? And then Solomon says, he says this, and though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. It's just this idea that that if you're in a fight, it's so much better to have someone who has your back. What I need you to remember this morning is that you actually have an enemy. Do you really believe that? That today you have someone, there is a force in this world, there is someone in this world who literally hates you and has spent considerable time thinking about how to steal, kill, and destroy in your life. Do you realize that that enemy is there? You need a small army of men or women who are committed to fighting for you. Now, just to be clear, Jesus Christ has already fought for us, and he's already been victorious for us. That is what happened when Jesus Christ went to the cross, was put in a tomb, and then walked out of it. When Jesus walked out of the tomb, he conquered Satan, sin, and death in that moment. In that one moment, when Jesus Christ walked out of the tomb, Satan, sin, and death were defeated. So what that means is Jesus Christ doesn't need you to be strong because he's already been strong for you. And the great news is that the, Paul in the book of Ephesians tells us that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is available to us every single day. And it is God's delight to unleash his resurrection power into our lives. But do not miss this. Often God displays his power through his people. And so do you have a few men or a few women who are committed to fighting for you? I tell every college guy I meet with, you need a small army. You have to have a small army of men in your life. Ladies, you need a small army of women because here's the thing. If no one knows about your porn addiction, if no one knows about your tendency to manipulate your diet, if no one knows about your tendency to be verbally harsh with your wife or your kids, then no one can help you. If you will not let people in to know what's going on, then you need to know that your life of isolation is only headed towards brokenness and pain. That's what's at the end of that road. You're on a path that will only lead to brokenness and pain. And God has wired you to need people. God has wired you to need relationships in which you can be fully known, that you can step into these environments where you can share everything. And they're not gonna run from you. They're gonna press into you. You need relationships where people are gonna ask you questions that you really don't wanna be asked. They're gonna zero in on your insecurities. They're not gonna let you get away with vague answers. Like, well, yeah, my wife and I, yeah, it's just been a tough week. Let me, let me just stop and ask, what does that mean? Well, yeah, I'm just, I'm just struggling with lust right now. Okay, thank you for being honest. What do you mean by that? Do you have these types of relationships in your life? A while back, I... Um, I watched two YouTube videos in the same day, and I don't spend a lot of time on YouTube. Uh, That's not what the Executive Breakaway does, is watch YouTube all day. But uh, I did watch two YouTube videos in the same day. And uh, the first one was a clip from the TV series Planet Earth. It came out in 2006, and so some of you guys might remember it. I think Planet Earth 2 has come out. I'm talking about the original here. And uh, some of y'all might remember this scene, but it's this scene 
where there is this massive herd of caribou that are traveling across a plain. And uh, the, the clip is of this pack of wolves who begin to hunt the herd of caribou. And so you see these wolves begin to track the caribou and then they go in pursuit. And once the herd of caribou senses that they are being pursued, the herd begins to splinter. And what you see is you see this one baby calf get isolated. And you get this, it, it's painful drone footage where you see just the, the overview of this baby calf being pursued by this wolf. And it slowly begins to gain ground until he reaches and overtakes the calf and it's game over. That's the first video I saw. And then that same day, I was talking to a guy who works for me, and Brent was like, have you ever seen the Battle of Kruger? And I was like, no. And I get onto YouTube, and I search Battle of Kruger, and I realize that at that point, I was, one of, I was not one of the 78 million people who had seen the Battle of Kruger. So clearly, I was missing out. If you haven't seen it, you've missed out longer than I did. All right, so that's on you. It's an eight-minute video. We're going to watch the whole thing. Not really. Not right now. Okay. I encourage you to go watch it, but I'm going to show you like a 40-second clip, which is going to bring it all together. Before I show it, let me just catch you up on what's going on. Uh, in my time of studying up on um, water buffalo and lions, which has not been an extensive study, but I have realized that there is massive drama between these two animals, all right? And so what you're going to see is you're going to see a herd of water buffalo come up upon a pride of lions. And this pride of lions is going to attack the herd of water buffalo, and they are going to isolate a calf, and it is going to seem as if it is game over for this baby calf. But watch what happens. Oh, my God. <laughs> Can we get the baby? Oh my God. Oh, she's, going the baby. she's going for him. She's going for him. She got it. No, they're going to come and try and chase the lion, but I think they're too late. I think you're right. They're way too late now. Whoa. And that one's. Look at Ooh. Ooh. The corner. Calf's still alive. It is? Yeah, it's trying to get away. It's standing up. It is, it's a stunning night. Oh, is it? Oh, that's going to the end of the water. It's standing up. It's We're standing up. It's running away. It's running away. Isn't that awesome? Man, that's going to get you pumped up for the Battle of Kruger you're going to be watching later on today. Good family devotional time right there. <laughs> But I watched that video, I can't help but think of 1 Peter 5, 8, which says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So the good question for you this morning is, do you have water buffalo in your life who have your back? <laughs> Isn't that awesome how this calf gets overtaken? And then here comes this herd just slowly creeping up, and they're like, no, sir, not today. Not today. Do you have those men or women in your life who have your back? Who love you enough to fight for you? Because remember, often God displays his power through his people. This is the life that God has created you for. God uses his people to challenge and encourage his people. God uses his people to lift up his people. God uses his people to warm his people. God displays his power through his people. So why would you go through life surrounded by people but being known by no people? Why would you go through life experiencing isolation instead of intimacy? Why would you go through life lonely instead of being loved? God has created you for more. That's the vision. That's the why. Now, let's turn the corner and let me show you why many of you will hear this talk and still settle for isolation in your life. 
Solomon shows us. Look at this, starting in verse 4. He says this. He says, Then I saw that all toil and all skill in work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. That word envy, it carries the idea of competition. You want to know why you will settle for isolation? It's because competition will kill closeness in your life. It will. Competition will kill closeness in your life. Pastor Andy Stanley talked about our need to have the er factor in our lives. We need to know that we are stronger, better, prettier, funnier, wealthier, godlier, successful er than the people around us in our lives. We need other people around us to be nobody so that we can feel like somebody's. And what ends up happening is that competition kills closeness. So I just want you to think about this. Have you ever experienced that, that really interesting satisfaction or peace that comes when you're single and you find out that your roommate's relationship ended? Have you ever experienced that weird peace? When someone else gets a, when, when you get a job promotion and the other person doesn't, or when you get into an organization and someone else doesn't, it makes you feel good in some way. It makes you feel more significant in life. Have you ever been sitting with someone and they're sharing about how their marriage is struggling and somehow it makes you feel better about your marriage? And you're almost thankful for their struggle so that it makes you feel better? Isn't that weird? You know what that is? That's competition. Competition will keep you from intimacy with others because it is hard to be close to someone when you will celebrate their weaknesses and resent their strengths. It's hard to be close to someone when you feel like you can only show your strengths because isn't that what we do when we feel in competition with other people? When we look around and we compare ourselves to others, you know what we do? We feel like we have to put forward only our best. That we have to hide the stuff that shows our weaknesses. And so we will only let people see a manufactured version of ourselves. There can be no intimacy there. First reason we will settle for intimacy is competition. Next, verse, verse 5. Solomon says, The fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. That's a pretty picture this morning. Welcome to church. Jesus loves you. Let's talk about a guy eating his flesh. But Solomon pictures a guy who's folding his hands. When do you fold your hands? Well, it's when you're sitting on the couch or laying in your bed watching a show. And so he pictures a guy doing nothing. He's painting the picture of a lazy and apathetic man. He does nothing. He has nothing. He has no drive. He has no ambition. He has no goals in life. And because he does nothing, he has nothing. And because he has nothing, he begins to turn in on himself and begins to eat his own flesh. Now, clearly, Solomon is exaggerating here. But he's showing something very important. Laziness and apathy in relationship will keep you from intimacy. It will. Do you know anyone like that? No drive, no ambition, no follow through, no faithfulness, no commitment to seeing something through, no initiative. Maybe you don't know that person because you are that person. Let me just tell you. You have to realize that healthy relationships take selflessness, sacrifice, consideration, thoughtfulness, care. And all of those things take intentionality. Apathy is the enemy of intentionality. 
The third reason that many of us will settle for isolation is found in verses 7 and 8. What Solomon is going to do is he's going to swing to the other side. He just painted the picture of a guy who has nothing because he does nothing, extremely lazy and apathetic. Now he goes to the exact opposite end of the spectrum. He says this again, I saw a vanity under the sun, one person who has no other. You see the isolation there. He has no other. Why? He has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil. And his eyes are never satisfied with riches so that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity in an unhealthy business, an unhappy business. He swings to the opposite end of the spectrum and he paints the picture of a guy who is in this insatiable pursuit of wealth and success. He's chosen riches instead of relationship. He's valued possessions over people. And so what you see is this guy, and the text is clear, he has no one. And he gives all of his time, all of his energy, all of his affection to what he does, to his work. And it's very interesting because the text is saying that this is vanity, meaning it's, it's meaningless, it's, it's empty, because this guy is never satisfied. His, his life is just a p- perpetual climb up a ladder. When he reaches the top of one ladder, it actually is the bottom of another ladder. So at some point, this guy is going to die climbing a ladder to experience some wealth or success. Let me just say this. God has wired some people in this room to be extremely high capacity. God has given some people in here minds that comprehend things and function in a way that few people's minds function. And I praise God for how he has wired you and gifted you. Be extremely good at what you do. Work at it with all your heart, but do not value possessions over people. Do not choose riches over relationship because in the end it will not be worth it. And you will find yourself on your deathbed looking at all your stuff alone. And in that moment you'll realize you can't take a lick of it with you. It will not be worth it. Look back at verse 13. Solomon tells a story that's very complicated. Commentators go different ways with it. I just want to point one thing out about this story. Solomon says, Better was a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. For he went from prison to the throne, though in his own kingdom he had been born poor. I saw all the living who move about under the sun along with that youth who was to stand in the king's place. There was no end of all the people, all of whom he led, yet those who come later will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and a striving after the wind. The most important part of that story to me is that we find a king who no longer knew how to take advice. It's interesting, the older you get, the more you feel like you know. And the more you feel like you know, the less you feel like you need when it comes to advice and wise counsel. And this creates a a great disconnect when it comes to intimacy and relationships. It is very hard to be near someone who cannot take advice. It's really hard to invest in someone who believes that they're always right and never wrong. It's very hard to get close to someone who is always defensive, who always has a reason for why they do what they do. It is very hard to be around someone who anytime you start speaking wisdom into their lives, they begin to zone out or look away and say, yeah, I already know that. Can you take advice? This is something I constantly have to work on. The attribute of being teachable. It's something I constantly have to work on. And I am by no means perfect. But can you accept the counsel of others? Do people, do not everyone, but do a few key people have the freedom to speak 
straight into your life. If not, I promise you will settle for isolation. See, competition, laziness, apathy, an insatiable desire for wealth and success, and an inability to take advice will keep you from intimate relationships. God has wired you to go through life experiencing deep, meaningful relationships with one another. Being loved is so much better than being lonely. Intimacy is so much better than isolation. This is what we've been made for. But it has to start with you coming to a realization where you can agree with King Solomon And it's this, that two are in fact better than one. Let's pray together. And I just want to invite you, just in the quietness of your own heart right here, before we leave and go out of this place, I just want to ask you, to to come back to the question that we started with. Who in this world truly knows you? With whom in this world are you fully known and fully loved? If no one comes to mind, are you willing to take a step? What's one step God wants you to take today? Maybe before you leave this place, you need to commit right now just to sending a text to someone and saying, hey, we need to talk. Or maybe you need to grab someone in the lobby and just say, man, I want what King Solomon was talking about. Can we we take a step towards that together? Would you be willing to take a step if there's anything in your life that is hidden right now, any sin that you're bearing right now, would you commit right now to exposing it this week to another person? Remember what God told Adam, it is not good for man to be alone. And then last, I just want to say, you know, we've been talking about being fully known and fully loved by others in our lives. But if you're here this morning and you, know, you don't know what it, it feels like to be fully known and fully loved by the God of the universe, then I just want to invite you this morning to step into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The reason that our faith centers around Jesus Christ is because Jesus Christ has come into this world to bring us into relationship with God. John 1.12 says, For as many as received him, he gave them the right to be children of God. Jesus Christ has come to give us an invitation into relationship with the God of the universe. Where we are fully known, God sees all of our failures, all of our imperfections, yet he showers us with his love because Jesus Christ has dealt with all of our failures when he went to the cross. If you don't know him this morning, the invitation to you is to come. Lord Jesus, we need you. We do, Lord. We, we just want to praise you that you have wired us to need others, that you have made us for relationship, Lord God. But it takes intentionality, Lord. We're we're not going to walk out of this place and just stumble into deep, authentic, transparent relationships. It takes vulnerability. And so I just pray that this week that we would take a step out of isolation and into intimacy. Lord, that even though we're surrounded by many, we would be known deeply by a few. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Hey, guys, have a great week. We'll see you back here for part three of the We Are series.